Anthem AVM90 or Moran's AV10. Which is the best processor? That's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delisalo with AudioHawks. We have a special guest in the house, Teo Nicolakis. How you doing, my friend? Gene, I'm doing great. How are you tonight? I am pumped up because we are going to be having a duke out with the two best 15.4 channel AV processors currently on the market. I say Marantz, you say Anthem. Let the viewers decide on which is the best processor for them. What do you think about that? I agree. And this is a, one of those situations where you actually can't lose. Uh, these are the best measuring processors that we've ever had on Audioholics. I've had the opportunity to also listen to the AVM10 at your house, and it's spectacular. Yep. So I think we're going to start to get down to details, and hopefully by watching uh, tonight's show – you and the audience will be able to figure out which one is really the better fit for you. Absolutely, man. So I really appreciate, Teo, you put together this awesome slide presentation. And it was thoroughly vetted by both Marantz and Anthem. We wanted to make sure that these products were properly represented. And we're going to go over the feature set as well as measurements. And then you guys could decide on which product works best for you. But like Teo said, you can't lose with either of these. These are, what did you call them? The Apex Predator? The Predator Apex of Predators of Pre-Pros under $8,000, no doubt. There we go. So here's just a little hero shot of the two. Now, you can't really tell from this photo, but the Marantz is actually substantially larger and deeper. So right. there's a lot of goes into Gazatas on the back of that thing. There's just a lot of meat inside of it, but that doesn't always necessarily equate to better. Maybe the Anthem is a little bit more efficient at certain things, or maybe it's just lacking some features here or there. Regardless of physical size, um, like I said before, these things are incredible machines, and we've heard full-fledged systems with both of them and their state-of-the-art performance. So we're not trying to pick sides here. We're just kind of you know teasing a little bit at the beginning. But let's get into what we're trying to discuss here on these products. So, Tay, I'm going to let you lead the way. No, that's great. So uh, just so everybody knows, Gene and I love both brands. As a matter of fact, we have owned and, and do own Anthem and um, Rants and also uh, Denon products. So when we speak about this, we're not speaking of it just from the perspective of reviewers. We're also speaking of it as where we put our money and uh, what we own. Uh, better in this particular case really is going to mean which product fits your needs and tastes better. And we're going to go into some of that to help you decide. And we'll highlight some of the differences because there's cosmetic differences, there's styling, the user interface, the DACs that are used between them, uh, room correction, onboarding technologies, uh, streaming, voice assistance, etc. So we hope that this will help you hone in on the stuff that actually really matters to you because all of us as consumers, we apply different value systems or weights to different aspects of a product. Uh, so yep. that's our goal tonight. Absolutely. Audio formats and technologies. So let's take a look at some of the basics as we're looking at these as uh, 15.4 channel processors. And in terms of the immersive formats that they support, they both support Dolby Atmos, uh, DTS-X and IMAX Enhance. And differentiator is the AV10 supports uh, DTS-X Pro and Oro 3D. So DTS-X Pro was an announced feature for the AVM90. That's not going to be the case. Uh, it's not going to be supporting it. So mm -hmm. if either Oro 3D or DTS-X Pro is important to you, then that really uh, shifts the weight to the AV10. And we just want to put a caveat to that. There's not a whole lot of content. And uh, it really is one of those things, is this really one of those value propositions that really matters? We're going to say, I, I, I got to be honest with you, Teo. I have the AV10 and I've never seen the DTSX Pro come on with any content that I've streamed or watched. Oral 3D, I've got Mondo Dio, which is some obscure European music group that's in Oral 3D. 
but there's not a lot of content like you said. Now I will tell you this, cause I've listened to Aura 3D up mixing on the AV10 as well as the Storm ISP. And you have the Focal Astro, which is a very similar uh, based Storm product. Right. There are differences in the Oro up mixing implementation on the Marantz versus the Storm. The Marantz has yeah. the newer version. So it's actually a little bit better for music. You have to do, you have to finagle the Storm processor to get music up mixing to sound good with Oro 3D. Otherwise, it's a complete disaster. And I did a video about that. But with that said, I've been doing a lot of listening on the AV10 in my family room system of two channel content. And I do like the Oro up mixer for two channel. I usually go back to the Dolby up mixer with center spread on. So it's a nice feature. The Oro up mixing is a nice feature, but if you're looking for native content, that's not going to be a deal breaker for you because there's not much for Oro 3D, at least in the United States. And unless you really care about the up mixing, like you said, either of these processors will give you plenty of processing to your heart's content. Yeah, and we're gonna go into some of the up mixing details in a couple of slides from now. So this is just a little bit of a flavor to give you uh, an idea of uh, how we're gonna do the presentation. Yeah. So when we start to get to the streaming technologies, we start to get into some real differences. Uh, so both will support Apple AirPlay 2, which is fantastic. Google Chromecast, however, is what you get with the AVM90. Uh, that's not available on the AV10. So if you're a Google Chromecast household, that may tip the scales for you. Spotify Connect is available uh, to both. And then we get to the pain point, and that's Rune. So Rune is still not available on the AVM90. And I think that enthusiasts do have uh, a little bit of a right to gripe at this juncture. And when it comes to the Marantz, though, it's a little bit of a misnomer. And I, let me explain to you why. Even though it's Rune tested, what that really means is you're just streaming AirPlay uh, via Rune. So you can do that to the AVM90 today. It just means that the Marantz has gone through some testing uh, to certify it, but you're not getting uh, rat loss of streaming protocol you actually get better Rune functionality through the Anthem with both the AirPlay and the Google Chromecast built in. The AVM90 will show up as both an AirPlay 2 and a Chromecast endpoint, so you can stream with both protocols. If and when, and I hope it's uh, soon, when the AVM90 does become a Rune certified endpoint, it will have runes rat lossless streaming protocol protocol natively built in so it's going to have full you know 24 bit 192 kilohertz streaming over the network which is great and awesome. then in terms of the proprietary stuff heos is uh, a denon Morant's technology so that's mm -hmm. built in it comes with all those and then there's Bluetooth on both. But what I like really about the Morantz is you can actually stream to Bluetooth headphones. So yeah. you, can, you can do from uh, a smart device to the AVM90 and the Morantz AV10, but then, hey, I have wireless headphones. I want to kind of shut the world out. That's a cool feature on the Morantz. So if anybody doesn't know what Rune is, um, Teo did an incredible interview with one of the principals of Rune. It was like an yep. hour long interview, right? Yeah. With, I'm going uh, to put it in the cards here so people with can With Eno Vandermeer, uh, Rune's founder and CEO. And I hope we'll be doing a little bit more of a deep dive. So one of my one of the things is I'll be doing some how to's and deep dives into Rune uh, in the coming months here on Audioholic. So we'll have some fun with that. You know, Teo, I'm so glad you're involved in this stuff because your enthusiasm, it, it's infectious. It makes me want to learn more about it too. That's great. All right, so let's uh, talk about up mixers as we talked about. So we have uh, Dolby Surround uh, both, and this is a differentiator. We've talked to Anthem and Gene, you've been such a big advocate for this. Mm -hmm. Dolby removed what's called center channel spread, the ability to put the center channel into center left and right. And thanks to your advocacy, it was put back into the Denon Marantz product. So that is a differentiator with the AV10. Yeah. The this is for two channel up mixing. Two yep. channel up mixing we're talking about. Yes. And here's the important thing Anthem followed the Dolby spec. So Gene and I had a conversation uh, with the folks at Anthem, and we're hoping that they are going to put that back in as well in the future. So just a little so, point so there. So, my understanding, the reason why this all became a controversy is. 
once Dolby came out with the height virtualization feature, you either license that or you license the original version with the center spread feature. You typically can't license both at the same time in the same black box. I'm not exactly sure how Denon and Marantz worked around that, but that's my understanding. Um, so my suggestion, because I do have an MRX 1140 in my fan, in my bedroom system, I don't like the Dolby Upmixer in two channel for this very reason, because there's no center spread. But Anthem has a really good upmixer. What's their uh, two music upmixer called? So it's it called the Anthem Music, and it's outstanding. So I think what it is is it's based on the old Hafler circuit, um, which was designed back in the 70s where it's left minus right uh, to the rears. And that does a really good job. Of course, it does the delays and all that. That does a really good job of upmixing two-channel music. And when I switch yeah. to that Anthem music mode, it's it's enjoyable. It's kind of similar to what you get with the Dolby upmixer. And I don't, I didn't hear any artifacting when I did the upmixer with the Anthem music mode. So if you guys really want to upmix your two-channel music, you don't like the fact that there's no center spread on the Anthem product, use the anthem music mode because i really think it's a good mode for Agreed. that it's very natural for two channel no question about it and yeah. then we get down to both have dtsx and of course oro 3d up mixer is what you get with uh the marantz because it supports oro 3d and you don't get that with the anthem you so, definitely have a few more options with the marantz than you do anthem so point one there for marantz that's great all right let's go to the next slide is video processing this is pretty easy. Uh, the Anthem comes with a whole host of, of, of video upmixing and uh, upsampling rather, and a whole host of video controls. The Anthem does not. So you get a basic on-screen display. The Marantz has an advanced on-screen display. So it'll show you what speakers are active, what the input signal is, all on the on-screen display in a nice graphical. Uh, you just get basic volume and a couple of other details, whether it's a 4K signal or what have you uh, with the Anthem. But video processing, 8K upscaling, uh, anamorphic lens support within the processor, those are all features of the Marantz AV10. So if you're a video file, you really want that um, functionality within the processor, then the AV10 is better in that regard. The Anthem really wants you to offload that uh, to the projector, to a Mad VR, or to do the video processing off board. And just to add caveats, uh, yeah, the Marantz has a clear advantage here for video processing because the Anthem doesn't have any. There's twenty, thirty thousand dollars processors from Storm Audio, which I have, and Trinov that don't have any of those features either. So kudos to Marantz because there's a lot of engineering involved in doing what they did. It's not easy. That's why if you look at the HDMI boards of the Marantz, there's like rows of heat sinks on those things, man. There's a, there's a lot of processing going on. So that is that is a big advantage for the Marantz that the Anthem doesn't have. Is it a problem for you? That's something that you have to decide. Like you said, Teo, a Mad VR or the post-processing uh, might be the route that you're going to go anyways. It, it's true. And just a, in defense of, to be apologetic to a degree, uh, the Anthem used to have probably some of the best video circuitry on the market in their pre-pros with the AVM 50 V and also with the D2 V yep. and I mean, it had broadcast grade uh, video circuitry. You could do fine noise control, et cetera, et cetera. And you could do it on a source by source basis, but that stuff becomes a boutique, uh, yeah. you know, feature and there's off-board processors that can do so much more. So it's not necessarily a bad choice uh, with Anthem Went, but you just get more value with the Marantz in that regard. Sure. All right. So let's look at our smart assistants. So Amazon Alexa, Google, Apple HomePod, all those are supported within the AV10 natively. And that's the important point. Uh, the Anthem AVM 90 uh, does not natively support Amazon Alexa. It did on the 60, so they've changed that with the 90. Uh, it does support Google Assistant, and it does not support Apple HomePod. And so a couple of caveats here. The Anthem will support them if you use a third-party controller, because the third-party controller will do that. So that's how I'm uh, functioning with my AVM 90. So it seems to me that Anthem has gone that route. And Anthem also has done something else that I think is worth noting. Uh, you, If you all have been following Anthem, you'll know that with the AVM 60, 
uh, Anthem made a conscious choice to go and commit to DTS PlayFi. So the networking stack, a lot of the underpinnings of the entire operating system on the unit and the way that it worked was based on DTS PlayFi. They forklifted that out. And now really they integrated the, the Google um, integration into the AVM90. So a lot of re-engineering work has gone into the AVM90 um, in that transition to the 60, where the AV10 is the consistent platform that Marantz and, and Denon have shared now for several generations. So it's a bit more mature in this regard. So just a little data point there. Yeah. Let's measurements. Look at measurements. All right. So, Cyanad. I know you, there's a religion for Cyanad out there, and they like to see really low numbers or high DB numbers, I should say. Let's just say that both of these processors are exceptional. I mean, you're splitting hairs when you're looking at 102 versus 103 or 106 versus 108. You're talking to the tenth of a thousandth place of a decimal point in percentage. Let me just reiterate, tenths of a thousandths place. This is beyond audibility. So both of these products have really good distortion, really good dynamic range. You gotta be happy if you have either of these products. They're gonna be transparent. They're gonna be low noise. And I I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but like on my Marantz AV10, I've got the, a, the Amp10 amplifier and I've got Perlison speakers, which are pretty high sensitivity. I'm thinking low 90s. I don't hear any hiss even a couple of feet away from the speakers. I'm sure you hear the same thing with the Anthem because the 1140 has an incredible preamp output on it. I don't hear any hiss on that. And the AVM 90 takes it to the next level. Absolutely. Yeah, the AVM 90 is the best processor Anthem's ever made. And I'm running them with benchmark amps, which actually have better specs than the Anthem. Better specs, amp. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, don't don't sit here and look at these numbers and be like, oh my God, it's 3 dB off or whatever. This is good stuff. <laughs> and just to note that the unbalanced is actually better performing on the Anthem. So the Anthem- And that's not surprising to me. Right. To be honest with you. That's uh, not surprising. Maybe it's worth stating because I think some folks don't, uh, let, let's, under, let's explain it. Just because a product has XLR or balanced outputs does not mean that it's a fully balanced input to output. Yep. And that is not the case here. So the Anthem is not a fully balanced unit. Yeah, and most consumer products aren't. They're not fully differential from input to output. They use a phase splitter at the end. And you could see that here. And, and I've seen this before with Anthem products. These single-ended um, connections are actually lower distortion. Right. So if somebody wants to geek out, go right ahead. All right, let's yeah. go on to the next slide. So again, this is an FFT showing you the harmonics off of a 12 kilohertz fundamental. And it's like, I can't even see because my my eyes are getting pretty bad with age, but was that minus 140, 130? Yeah, you get down to 150 yeah. and then you <laughs> go up from there. How's that? Yeah, you are clean, my friend. That is a clean FFT. SIMT ratio, that's the distortion to the noise ratio versus the generator. So it's based on as, you, as you're increasing the level of, of the uh, signal on the input, you're getting lower noise and distortion. You can see it's down to, what is that, like minus 110 dB at about minus 5 dB? Yes. Of a generator level. Yeah, that's good. So all good stuff, like we were saying before, another multi-tone test here. This is clean. This is from yep. the Anthem again. Um, these are not my measurements. These are uh, actually done by Anthem and we checked it with their engineers. And I think even audio science review measured it and got similar results as well. So yes. this is legit. This is legit from the same kind of test gear that I use myself over here when I bench test. And these are my measurements. And what I did was I showed you the drive level of the Marantz balanced first unbalanced. And you can see, again, uh, the unbalanced gives you a little bit lower noise at the lower uh, drive levels. And then the advantage of balanced is above about two volts. And I plotted Cyanide with it, too. I typically don't do that anymore because it's too confusing. But the bottom line is this thing puts out, what was it, 12 volts RMS unclipped? <laughs> you could drive a truck with that. Man. <laughs> Most amplifiers will go full power at about two volts RMS, four volts unbalanced. Uh, this has 
droves more drive than that. And the advantage of that is that the lower voltages, it's just clean. It's before the knee of the of the graph. You could see like at eight or nine volts, it's right before the knee. That's really low distortion. So this is an excellent preamp. This is an audiophile grade preamp. The analog circuits in the Marantz are state of the art. And that's part of the thing is that they use their HDAM circuits, which is proprietary to Marantz. So what are we looking at here? The this my input and the multi-channel pre-outs. Yeah, just to show you the bandwidth. I mean, look at that. It's, it's flat to the limit of my audio precision test gear. Very clean. Now, I think this is with the filter one, filter two, right? Uh, yeah, and I've got the the DAC filters in a couple oh, slides. Okay. Yeah, and then the other, the other one what's rolling off is just showing you the base management of the subwoofer output. Again, excellent measurement. This is my FFT at one kilohertz, and man, I wish I had. It's about one. Rates. It's minus one twenty. Is kind of where the base is coming. Yeah, and that, and that that noise level depends on the sampling rate too. That, so I might I might have used a lower sampling rate than uh, than Anthem used. So that's not really the noise floor of the amplifier. But look at the fundamental. Uh, the third harmonic is like one hundred and eight or one hundred and nine dB below the fundamental of one kilohertz. So that's really really good. And then the DAC. Oh, here's the DAC. Here's the DAC center. Okay, so they have a filter one, filter two. Filter one is a, is the audiophile version, and filter two is the test bench version. Personally, I prefer filter two because it doesn't do that roll off. Um, I know Marantz has their sonic signature where they like things to sound warm. Uh, I did listen, and a lot of this also depends on your room correction and how you set it up. I toggled it back and forth. It could be placebo because I know filter two has less roll off. It's really depending on what you guys what you guys like. So that brick wall of filter one obviously doesn't have as good of a transient response in the stop band as as the filter two because it's more gentle roll off. But you're losing a couple of dB at 20 kilohertz. I can't hear 20 kilohertz anymore. But maybe your dog would appreciate filter two over filter one. I would just recommend you guys try both. But I and, think, and that's I think the takeaway though, Gene, is a lot of folks don't even know that Morant has right. the default filter and then yeah. you can change it. The anthem does not. The anthem just has a one filter that they've decided on for, for the processor. So you don't have that option. So give me comments down below if you're a Morant's owner, uh, if you've played around with the DAC setting on this, which one do you prefer? I really do think I prefer filter two personally. Yeah, and then but go to the next slide and I have the other graph as well. Yeah, there you go. Okay. That's the one I was kind of looking for yeah. too. So yeah, this shows you the stop and roll off and you can see the filter one is much gentler. It's, you know, it's not as not like a brick wall above the sampling rate or half the sampling rate, I should say. So that just kind of shows you what's going on. But either way, if you look at the outer band, there's no artifacting. Believe it or not, like even in my storm processor, when I met when I did this kind of measurement, it's noisy in those 40 to 50 kilohertz range compared to this. This is a much better DAC implementation than what's in currently in my storm processor, which mm -hmm. that thing is like $24,000. Better DAC in, in the Marantz and the Anthem than my storm. Absolutely. And speaking of DACs, if you go to the next slide, let's start talking about a little bit of the audio, audio circuitry. circuitry. Here we go. I'll let you take this one. So uh, when it comes to DACs, there is a difference. Uh, whether or not you put value on this is up to you. But without question, uh, the Anthem has the flagship DAC. So mm -hmm. it has uh, the ES9038 Pro from ESS Technologies, the ESS Sabre, and there are two of them. So this is a 32-bit 768 kilohertz DAC. It has a dynamic range of 132 dB uh, when it's used as the eight channels and to total harmonic distortion and noise is minus 122 dB. The Marantz AV10 is using a slightly different uh, choice. They're using stereo DACs. They're mm -hmm. using the ES9018 uh, K2Ms, and they have 10 of them. That's also a 32-bit DAC. Uh, not as good, per se, in the dynamic range, 127, but still outstanding, exceptional, you know, uh, and minus 120 on total harmonic distortion and noise. So in terms of DAC implementation, you're getting some of the best that's out there, just a little bit of a nod um, to the Anthem in that regard. 
So let's go over to the next slide, which is about- And the other thing that's good to mention about this is some processors will give you the prime DAX on the front channels and then they'll skimp on the surround channels and the subwoofer channels and neither Marantz or, or Anthem are doing that. They're giving you equal DAC performance on every channel, including the subwoofer channels. And there's four subwoofer channels on both of these processors. And I should note Anthem, I don't have it listed here, but Anthem is using the stereo version of the 9038 Pro for the subwoofer channels. So you're getting a 32-bit, 768 kilohertz with 132B dynamic range on each of the subwoofer channels as well. There you go. So uh, slight differences in terms of the way some of the circuitry is. The PCB layer is a six layer for the Anthem, four layer for the Marantz, and all of them have significant upgrades between the two. The op amps, the voltage regulators, the resistors are all upgraded with the AVM90. Uh, Gene, you mentioned the HDM modules, the transformer, and lots of other circuitry upgrades with the AV10. So the two companies have really thrown the kitchen sink, and this is their flagship, and they've done an outstanding job. So it's not just the DAC that matters, but yeah. it's the entire... Yeah, it's the implementation. And as of today, this is the best expression from the two companies with the 90 and the 10 and they've done so, the so in consumer audio you're lucky most uh, most consumer audio is like two layer boards so the fact that they're four layer for the marantz and six for the anthem that opens up a lot of performance advantages you could do more ground planes inside of those boards you could just do more trace routing i mean there's so many different options of how you could put things together on a board and it costs a lot more to manufacture a pwb that has four or six layers so that's for consumer audio that's awesome yeah room correction so this is really what the differentiator is between the two products it is I, and i think it's worth saying that if you're an enthusiast and you're coming at this and say i like this room correction better there's really no choice at, at that point. You've already come in and that's your uh, that's the weight of where you're putting the feature set. But we want to go through a couple of these things to be able to articulate that what the differences are. So when it comes to the AVM90, Anthem makes Anthem Arc and that's proprietary to Anthem. So that's what you get with the AVM90. And just a couple of important points is you get the latest version Arc Genesis, and it's a full robust version that has no limits whatsoever on the software and the room correction. So one of the brand, a brand new calibrated microphone is included that is specific to the AVM90 and the AVM70. So there's a dot on the microphone that is directional that allows you to get better measurements above the five kilohertz. So if you are using an acoustically transparent screen or you wanna uh, correct the speakers above that recommended five kilohertz uh, in the previous processors, that's all included. It's cross-platform for Mac and PC. Uh, and obviously Odyssey and Dirac. So the bottom line is it doesn't cost you anything. All of this is built into the cost of the purchase of the AVM90. When it comes to the AVM10, you actually get quite a few choices. The built-in version is the Multi-Q XT32, but it's limited. And I, I want to be careful how I phrase that. Uh, you have to plug the microphone into the processor and you get this on-screen GUI. And frankly, I don't like it. And I don't mm -hmm. think anyone who's spending $7,000 plus is going to be satisfied with the built-in Odyssey Multi-QXT. Number one, uh, you don't realize it, but it puts this mid-range compensation, which we hate and I can't stand, and you can't disable it. So at the very least, you need to spend $25 to get the mobile app well, that. you can put, you can select the flat setting, which disables. Oh, the okay. There yeah. you go. Which I would recommend don't use the Odyssey curve anyway, because it's going to roll off the highs unless you're using like some clipped horns or something that are bright. But you're right. I mean, you don't buy a seven seventy five or a $7,000 processor and just use the standard Odyssey, right? So I just want to throw this out here. When it comes to having all of this ability of room correction, whether it's Odyssey or Dirac, Always remember this. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. You could really mess up your system if you don't know what you're doing, right? 
I mean, I just want to give you a quick example here. This is my family, my family room system with the AV10 running Perilous and speakers. I have Odyssey PC with the separate calibration kit. Those are my left and right speakers at the main listen and position with the subs integrated. That's incredible. That's like perfection. But that was not, that did not come easy. That took me, you know, an hour or so of measuring and then tweaking and tweaking. I probably spent three or four hours and then probably another hour after that, just tweaking, getting into the software, adjusting the bi quad filters, adjusting the delays of the subs that it didn't get quite right. What I love about Anthem Arc Genesis is yes, it's not as powerful as Odyssey or Dirac, but it also, I always find in my experience with running art, um, running Arc is it does less damage out of the box than most room correction systems. Like you could run Anthem Arc in 10 or 15 minutes and then maybe adjust the base level up in the software. And then nine times out of 10, it sounds good. Like it sounds really good. And the interface is so easy and intuitive of the Arc Genesis. And in fact, when I do consultations, Teo, nine times out of 10, when, when I get a newbie that comes in and never doesn't even know what REW is, doesn't know what a separate microphone is, I'll be like, you know what? If you're choosing between the Marantz or the Anthem, I would steer you towards the Anthem. And then if you're buying the Anthem, I would recommend you buy from our channel partner, Audio Advice, because they'll look at your calibration file afterwards if you get if you get confused and they'll help you with that. And I'll put links below to our affiliates. But if you're in a more advanced user and you like to fiddle with your room correction and you want the flexibility of adding PEQ function and you want the impulse correction response that, that Odyssey and, and Direct offer, and you, or if you have a pro calibrator coming in, the Marantz might be the better choice for you because those room correction systems have more advanced features than the Arc Genesis. But Teo, you've you've messed with both. I, I've I've got experience with all three. So I have Arc Genesis on the ninety. Uh, I have Odyssey Multi QX, uh, the PC version on the Denon eighty five hundred HA, and mm -hmm. uh, using Dirac on the Focal Astral sixteen. I have a tremendous amount of respect for all three. And what I would say is, Gene, to your point, the Anthem is super easy. Arc Genesis is super easy to use. Yeah. Um, it it gives you the features and functionality exactly where it is. There are some minor tweaks that you can do, and it just sounds great. And a, the most important point that I can say is, if you just want to get up and running and you want something that sounds great, Arc Genesis goes with the do no harm, and it always sounds better uh, afterwards. With um, Multi-QX on Odyssey, it is by far the preferred way to go. I do not uh, recommend doing the iOS mobile app. Uh, it's great, but not for an AV10. You, yes. you have lots of features. Uh, you do have to probably put a little bit of a, a, a shelf uh, in the lower end to raise the base. So there's some tweaks that you do need to do. And you, you did a, we did a video on that. You remember the video we did? And I'll yeah, and, and yeah. there's some additional things that I've done to really tweak my Odyssey implementation. And really it's the most current version that I think Odyssey is finally up their game. And of course, Dirac is just exceptional. But if you don't do it right, you can make your system sound worse with uh, Dirac. So again, pros and cons. Well, uh, and I'll tell you, I've tried to run Dirac on the AV10 three times and I had Matthew Pose here and, and on the AV10, I could not get the uh, delays set properly on it. So I just kind of gave up. And I spent my focus on the Odyssey and you saw the results I got. Eventually I'm going to revisit it because now they have direct live base control on the AV10, which that's another cool advantage of the AV10 is they have the ability to one day add direct art because they got the four independent sub outs. They got plenty of processing MIPS, like 2000 MIPS or something like that. So they, they can run a third world country with the processing power that's in, that's in that processor, right? So both of these are just, awesome um i'm really a big fan of doing it right you know looking at the measurements afterwards and then listening and then making the adjustments and the phase alignment tool of the anthem just works man it really does it uses yeah. all path filters to align the subs with the lcrs and it's ingenious because it really does a good job 
And I, I should also note that that's a with, new feature. It's a new feature, so it'll automatically do the phase for every sub that you connect. And it also comes with one of our favorites, which is um, an auto measurement tool built into Arc Genesis. You don't need yeah. to learn any other software. And in the newest version with the AVM90, what's really cool is you can do a measurement with Arc and without, without doing anything. So just hit measure. And then you can see exactly what's happening and tweak from there. And that um, quick measure is what that feature is called. It helps you also position your sub. So just a lot of great stuff that's built into the Anthem that makes it easy to get up and running. So and why don't we go on to the next slide? Yeah, the last thing I want to say about this, the biggest disadvantage for Odyssey is you have to plug the mic into the receiver, even if you buy the mic calibration kit. Whereas yep. with Arc and with Dirac, you run it off your, P your laptop, which is way better especially if your av processor is not in the same room as your display and speakers that's true so let's get into another differentiator and that's with the avm 90 with uh, arc genesis you can do four independent measurements and then all of those measurements that you do and, and what i want to define is like a main listening position so i might have the microphone in my main listening position i can do five uh, just for a single sweet spot. I can do another set of measurements because I want to have a single row with a couch. And then I can do another set of measurements for two rows. So I can do up to four of those. And I can then create up to four profiles that have different configurations. So lots of flexibility. And then I can assign any measurement, any arc measurement to any of the 30 virtual inputs. So I mm. could have a measurement with the obvious one is like with my movie theater screen up and my movie theater screen down and I can create two inputs to that. You have all that flexibility and power from a usability point of view with the Anthem that you don't get with the Marantz. With the Marantz, you have uh, two uh, measurements and uh, just a quick shout out to Phil Jones. He was quick to point out that you do have some additional uh, advantages using the remote control and some quick recalls that give you the advantage to do uh, more than just two um, than what we have here. But you really can't do it on an input by input basis as seamlessly as you can uh, with the Anthem. And I, I do love the virtual inputs. I yep. think it's a big game changer from a usability and a user interface point of view. And my one request to the Marantz and uh, the Denon team is I'd love to see virtual inputs and uh, do what Anthem and Storm and some of these other uh, companies have had for a long time. Yeah, I, I remember the virtual inputs even on the Anthem STR. So that's kind of where I think it started. Yeah, it's a bit. It, Anthem has always had that going back. I mean, I've been an Anthem user back to the AVM twenty days, oh, and wow. I believe that you know I I don't want to uh, dust rust off my memory here, but yeah, at least from the AVM fifty, um, and I think going back to the twenty, you had that concept of virtual input. So that that's been part of their DNA for a long time. Gotcha. User interface and intangibles. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, you got to use the product. Uh, I don't know about Eugene, but my, the thing that I experience most is the pre-pro or the processor. That's mm -hmm. my experience of my audio setup and how much I enjoy using the processor or the AVR kind of determines how much I enjoy my system to a degree. So from the perspective of just setup, uh, the Anthem is a basic setup. Uh, it, you know, you need Arc to get up and running. And there are some important setup things that you need to do. In particular, set max volume so you don't blow out your speakers. And you do need a little bit of experience. So this is, the Anthem requires you to read the user manual. Read the user manual. Did I say read the user manual? Mm -hmm. And and get it up and running uh, with, with the help of someone. With the Marantz, Wow, for several generations now, going back to the 7200 of the Denon. So I'm talking maybe, was that five, six years? Oh, They've least, done an yeah. unbelievable job with a graphical user interface that takes you step by step with all the connections. It's really well done. And it is for both the novice and the professional. So kudos to what uh, they've done from the setup experience point of view. And then from aesthetics, um, the AVM 90 is a typical box, but I got to tell you, I, I love the Marantz. 
the Moran is it's, it's just it's a eye candy. candy. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's got that scalloped uh, look on the sides. So yeah. if you just want to show that off, uh, to me, that's that. However, it's as, it's as big as a flagship receiver. I mean, this thing is beast. I didn't mention that, but some folks will have trouble fitting the Morants into a rack or a cabinet. It is that big. So that's something that also may be uh, a consideration in some yeah. installations. So you could turn those lights blue, by the way, on the uh, that halo. You could uh, reconfigure it. I, there's a, a keystroke. I forgot what it was, but it turns it blue. Oh, that's cool. I didn't realize that. That's <laughs> yeah, cool. it's pretty cool. I want to highlight the other feature of the Morantz is their porthole. The porthole is impossible to read. So yeah. if you're going to... I don't know what they're going to do from a UI point of view. Um, if anybody's watching this from the Moran side of things, that should become just an OLED display. The porthole should be the OLED. And then when you want to change it, the whole thing should just magically be able that to change into something. Yeah. So again, I like making suggestions. They've been good to accept some of them. Like we'd like to see uh, Dirac on the products and some other yeah. things Rune. Uh, that would be my vote on what to do with uh, a flagship Morantz in the future. Otherwise well, you know, they Morantz added a feature I asked for over a decade, and nobody else has it unless you go with a Storm or a Trinov. Not even Anthem has it. So if you're running really large, base-capable main speakers, you could route LFE to the main channels and still have LFE go to the subs. That's pretty freaking cool. But that only works with Odyssey. It won't wor work with Dirac. So if oh, you're running Dirac, you lose that LFE event. Dirac has this thing where they want to high pass your main speakers no matter what. And I'm trying to fight them to change that because I'm having that problem with Dirac Art in my main system right now. It's high passing my main speakers, which have four 12s in them. And that's why in the storm, uh, mentioning storm, that's why you have to create a clone of that profile of the Dirac measurement before you can do anything and edit it. Anyway, yeah. that's the side. Okay, if you want a larger display on the Morantz, you do have to flip down the flap. Yeah, is what it is. Uh, the Anthem, it's Spartan, it's super clean, and it just has a beautiful display. Um, you can have the volume, you can show the arc status uh, on or off, you can show the input, and then you can show the signal that's coming into the processor in the four corners of that display. You can see that 18 feet away. So if that usability is something that's important to you, then the Anthem's actually the better product. It's all these little intangibles. Now, what Anthem did here, from an aesthetics point of view, is they streamlined the front panel. The AVM50 and the D2V, the AVM20, used to have a ton of buttons. Not anymore. You have just the volume button. You can do input left and right, menu, and power, and that's about it. Well, here's the other caveat. You no longer have zone two power on uh, the front panel. So you do have to use either the remote or you have to use mobile app to turn on zone two. So just a couple of usability differences uh, between the two products there as well. That's a TFT display on the front of the... It is. Yeah, I love it. You can, like you said, you can see it from 12 feet, 15 feet away. No problem. It's great. It's great. All right. So let's go on to the next item with uh, just some of those things that we talked about with the aesthetics. Again, you have 30 virtual assignable inputs. And I cannot emphasize enough how great that is. So you could assign uh, HDMI video. You could sign a different audio signal. You can mix and match all of these items. You can have different arc measurement profiles on an input by input basis. So really gets the nod there. The Marantz has seven, what I'll call fixed. Yes, you can assign a different HDMI, but once you use one of the inputs, you can't use it for um, another one. You have seven of them only. Uh, the remote, the Marantz clearly gets the nod. It's a metallic yeah. high end gorgeous backlit remote. The Anthem has a plastic one that's the same as the AVM60. And what I will say is uh, I like the fact of the remote when it's new. It's got a great feel and grip, but that coating wears off after about three years and it kind of becomes sticky. So just something to keep in mind. So we talked about the display, um, the lights, the front panel, the Anthem has the power button always on. So that's annoyed a very small handful of people. So they put a little uh, wa rubber washer over it to hide mm. and dim that blue uh, LED. But 
on the Moranch, you have that uh, that's dimmable. We talked about the GUI before. It's basic on screen with the Anthem, and you really have an advanced uh, display with the AV10. For some people, this is important. The Anthem's made in Vietnam, and the Marantz AV10 is made in the flagship uh, factory in Japan. Shurikawa. Shurikawa. Oh, so cool. Very cool. So I, don't know if you I don't know if you mentioned that the, they both have apps. They do. They I, both like have the apps. I like the graphical interface of the Anthem app. The, the Anthem app is... It's not fully even, fleshed out, maybe, but I, I do like the... yeah. Um, so maybe I'll load it here while we're, we're doing it. What I like about the has an app too. And overall it, you could actually do all the functionality. Yeah, there you go. Let me, it, let me zoom in on it. There, sure yeah. Again. What you need is, is just here on the app. Like yeah. it's just there. I want arc on and off zone one, zone two. It's so easy to turn your arc on and off. Boom. Whereas like the Morant's when you got to dig through their app, it, it, it frustrates me. a ton me. of stuff, but it's just clunky. It's, so I don't find it a joy intuitive. to use. Yeah. Like if somebody wants to, if you were over my house and you wanted to listen to music on my Perlison system with the AV10, you're like, can you switch to two channel? And I got nervous. I'm like, I can, but I have to go through this damn app and you got to go through like three layers, three layers to get to it. It's not that easy. Whereas that Anthem one is pretty easy to switch between surround on and off. Stereo. Or again, set up different inputs and then all the virtual inputs that you program um, get loaded. So I'll see if I can do it here. They get loaded right here on the menu. So I have uh, my Cambridge audio running rune. I've got uh, my OPPO running rune. I've got all these virtual inputs That's that cool. I've set up. So all that gets loaded onto the app. So again, depends on what you want. So we're going back and forth basically with these two products. <laughs> flagship. This is just great. So not, not a whole lot more to say here. Uh, but if it's important, again, you have the seven matrix, they both have seven HDMI inputs. Um, the AV 10 is a three zone, whereas the AVM 90 is a two zone unit. Uh, you do have two HDMI outs that are mirrors for uh, the main zone. And then you have an independently switched HDMI out for zone two. Uh, you have eARC available. And then our conversation about triggers. So A, I'm so happy the AVM90 is back with multiple triggers uh, mm -hmm. with three of them. And what's really cool is the triggers can also be set and programmed over IP and also activated over RS-232. So you get a lot of really cool ways to control the triggers, not just through the mobile app. The Marantz AV10 has two 12 volt DC triggers and it has a special additional two that are made specifically for Marantz power amps. So if you use the two amp uh, triggers that are there and use the Marantz uh, control cable, what you can do is you can not only power on the Marantz based amps, but you can also control the lighting and you can control a whole other uh, set of other granular features on the amps through those uh, trigger outputs those two additional ones so it's pretty they cool. started that they started that with when denna did the avp separates they had communication between the amp and the preamp and it's really you could control the bridging and all that other functionality on it it was pretty cool the channel assignments all that stuff so yeah that's look it's hard to decide which processor is right um good and if it matters, you get two balanced inputs on the Marantz. You have no balanced inputs any longer on the AVM90. But lo that, look at that. This. That is for an audio file. That is an important thing. If you have a high-end SACD player and you want to use the XLR outs, you can only do that with the AV10, not the Anthem. Well, I'll reserve comment on that one. <laughs> 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 because I, I will simply say the DAC is so good. You're going to want to use the DAX on uh, either of these you, anyway, yeah. even if you have a high-end uh, CD player. I there mean, are folks in the forums who are geeking out about uh, plugging in external DAX to both of these units. Don't do it. Just splitting hairs. Don't the do it. The advantage that you get yeah. with these flagship DAX and the room correction is yeah. going to blow those, those analog DAX. But if that's what you like, that's the other power of these units. 
their audio circuitry is so transparent yeah. that you have that flexibility. So I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm, I'm doing it ton in cheek. I just want to say the circuitry is so good on this stuff. No, the thing I noticed about mm -hmm. Anthem in the past, especially with the STRs, is the analog to digital converters are really good. So yeah. if you put an analog signal in and it goes through the DSP, it's still very low noise, low distortion. You can't say that about most consumer gear. They, they usually skimp on the analog to digital converters, but I have not seen that with the Anthems. Anthem will ask you to do it at 192 as well. It'll do analog to digital at 192. Yeah, so they're, using good, they're using good so, converters. Yeah, it's great. So this is the back of the AV-10. You can see there's a lot of Gazintas, Gazaldas. Everything you want in a modern But product. there's no legacy connections. So if you have a, a Nintendo Wii, you better get one of those little... Uh, component video to HDMI adapters like I had to do when I switched to the AV-10. I don't right. think there's legacy right. support on the Anthem either, right? No, Anthem got rid of all that with the, with the 60. That's the Anthem, yep. yep. So all balanced outputs. So I got to tell you, the Marantz is a sexier, the, the Marantz has a sexier back end. Yep, agreed. It really does with the copper and all that stuff. It's just, yeah. Better industrial design. From that perspective, no. Oh, so we're, we're not done yet. About... Damn, damn, tail. Huh? <laughs> we're we're not done yet. <laughs> Control interfaces. So, just very quickly, both products have a really great web user interface. I tend to like the AVM nineties a bit more, yeah. and it just gives you everything at a glance, easy adjustments, and there are some controls that are actually unique to the web interface of the Anthem that you don't get through the on-screen GUI or through the remote control. And the uh, web interface can double as a remote control uh, if you want to load it on a tablet. So let's go to the next screen for some examples. And you can see, you can power on the unit. You have the levels for all of the speakers. Everything's at a glance, the zone, general speakers, inputs. If you want to configure the device, just do it through the web GUI. Go to the next uh, slide, Gene, and look at everything that you get here. Uh, the display brightness, how you want to configure your zone two, uh, the HDMI CEC settings, the controls, everything's at a glance, and then one more. And you can see the granular control you get over um, the speakers themselves on the next slide. Yeah, it's very non-intimidating. Non yep. And what I like about the Anthem 2 is it actually shows you your speaker layout for each of your profiles. And that's an important thing. So it actually shows you, remember you can load up to four profiles. So this one was an Atmos calibration. I have another one that's a 2.2 channel calibration, a 2.4 and some other uh, tweaks that I've done. So you can see I have granular control over all aspects of each of those profiles. And then I can sign them to any virtual input. Yep. And let's go to the final slide here, just to show again, phase control, uh, you name it. And then you can, uh, set custom crossovers, et cetera, et cetera. So all that power. But you'll want to do yeah. all that in Arc. You'll really, you don't want to mess with that with the with the web interface for for the Anthem processor itself. You should let Arc dictate all of this. That is correct. There's one caveat. The one thing that Arc will always do is Arc will always upload polarity normal to a sub. If you want to do an inverted polarity for whatever reason, you have to do it through the web GUI. So that's a little power user trick. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yep. And there you go. Uh, all the granular settings, again, you get on the virtual input. So you just don't get this on the Marantz to that extent. The Marantz, yeah. to their credit, uh, they have an updated web GUI that was getting long in the tooth, as they yep. say. Uh, but again, not as sexy with the Marantz, but has all the functionality at a glance. You can power the unit on all the zones. You can see all the inputs, uh, what's assigned every speaker. So functional, basic, and you can do backups through the web GUI as well. So that's an important point for both products. So you can back up your settings to a USB drive or- Yeah, to and to be honest with you, like you said, the web interface is sexier on the Anthem. Yeah, just is. Um, we talked about the remotes, but again, Plastic, uh, the mobile app is streamlined and functional on the AVM90. It's more feature rich on the AV10, but can be more confusing. And third party controllers is just strong on both products. Oh, yep. So it's great. And then you know, we got to say gremlins. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the AVM90's got some gremlins. And I talk about that in the review. Uh, there are issues with CEC that I've come across and there are some anecdotal things that have come across about volume 
uh, jumps and maxing had, out. <laughs> yeah, some folks had said that that was um, with Spotify. I have not experienced that myself, so I can't say that. But you always want to set a max volume, and and I just want to emphasize this is not uncommon with boutique high end companies. You'd be so surprised with some of the things. But what I've found is that there's really a great user uh, community uh, with the Anthem products and with the AVM 70 and 90 in particular. Um, I'm on uh, the uh, AVS forum uh, community there with some regularity. There's a lot of really knowledgeable and um, expert folks. And of course, Anthem's tech support is outstanding. So we really want to highlight uh, all that. Uh, with yeah. the AV10, our experience, Gene, here at Audioholics, is the Den and Moran's products have the most bulletproof HDMI switching we've experienced in just about everything. Yamaha as well has tended to be very, very good, but rock solid HDMI handshaking, extensive documentation. So uh, just minor. Now, I will I will tell you this, and I don't know if it's an Apple TV thing or not. And I'm also running fiber off the cable uh, bullet train cable from upstairs to the TV downstairs. Every now and then I get a, a um, an HDMI message on my Apple TV. HDCP thing. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's the Moran's causing it or if it's Apple. I It's a gremlin. But it, it, it I get it on my JVC. And also with the Storm, the Astral uh, 16, yeah. I get it upstairs sometimes with the AVM 90. So absolutely, positively. HDMI happens. just sucks. Let's just be honest. Yeah. Uh, Docker is HDMI is. is a great product. I should do a plug. I have uh, some of the stuff in hand from HD Fury. So I want to give them a shout out. So anything that you have with HDMI diagnostics that you want to do, take a look at HD Fury. I'll be doing a segment in a couple of months with some of their stuff, which is outstanding for diagnosing um, HDMI issues. All right. So let's wrap this up because we're approaching the hour. Simply put, reference. Reference to channel, multi-channel performance, easy to use in everything in the box that you want for maximum performance with the AVM90. Uh, Marantz AV10, reference to channel, multi-channel, features galore. And if you're a custom installer, this is really your dream. And plus, you can even look at some of the cloud control features of multiple installations. Uh, ARC for room correction, simple, powerful, do no harm and it will sound better and you're just done. With the Marantz AV10, you've got to upgrade to the full version of Dirac or Odyssey mm -hmm. Multi-QX, that's the PC version, for max performance. And it does really require a level of expertise and investment to get the right tweaking uh, to optimize the processor for your environment. Uh, physical on-screen display. Um, the Anthem is a little bit better in that regard. The on-screen display, uh, sorry, the, the uh, on-screen display is not as great. The yeah, Morant really yeah. takes the case. So the Morant shows you everything if you yeah. want it to. The Anthem doesn't. You have to use the web interface. Yeah, and Anthem's approach, I think, is their, their two-channel roots is the audio matters. So that's where they're going to put their focus. We're going to support the stuff that matters. The Marantz just gives you the kitchen sink. <laughs> you yeah. just get everything. Yeah, I mean, guys, they're both incredible products. Teo, you have the AVM90. I have the AV10. Um, I wouldn't trade mine. You wouldn't trade yours because they're right for the needs that we have them for, yeah. right? Yeah, I, the one thing that I can say... Every single time I sit down and I, I listen to the setup with the AVM90, it just sounds so good. It, it just yeah. sounds right to me. Uh, so that's all I care Look, about. And I experienced that with the 1140 um, in my bedroom system. I just love the, the way that thing set up. It was so easy to get that thing to sound good quickly with ARC again. I want to do more ARC stuff i think we should do you should do an updated video with the avm 90 so that's and coming in, in part yeah. three yeah i think our takeaway here is uh, you are if you're looking at these products flagships 
there's going to be something about the value proposition or some aspect between the Marantz or the Anthem that's going to resonate more to you. And hopefully by going through some of the different elements that may have checked off, oh yeah, that really matters to me, or I want to learn more about that and, and help you make a decision because these are just amazing products that will just enhance your music and your movie experience. Well, Teo, I really appreciate you putting all this effort into this slide presentation. Guys, don't forget, we have affiliate links below. You could uh, help the channel out by purchasing from either of those um, links that we have for these products, and you get great support from our channel partners as well. If you like this video, please hit the thumb up, hit the subscribe. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. We appreciate your support. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.